Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I welcome you to the, the first ever seminar uh, that INCJ Network has uh, put on? Uh, it's just great from my point of view to see so many faces uh, coming from different parts of Europe and also the UK. And we're doing our event today on the title of the Future for International Development in Criminal Justice. Now, this is the first time we've done it, so it's going to feel a bit awkward. But what I'm really hoping that everybody will feel that you can contribute to the discussion. And we've got four really different uh, people today uh, with different ideas. And they've been kind enough to produce a paper, which we'll be putting on uh, the website so that people can read it and reflect on it, not just around this table, uh, but around Europe as well. So that, that's a, another way that we can communicate, not just talk, but also read. But we are delighted that you're able to join us this afternoon. And um, what we hope is that this is just a start. We have no idea where this network is going to take us. Um, and to start us off, I'm going to ask Dave Ward, uh, who's a professor at De Montfort University that is uh, the organization that's hosting this uh, website and Dave I'd like you to start by welcoming everybody this afternoon thank you thanks very much John um, I was going to uh, do a little formal introduction um, but I think I will um, cut that very short because I think we really want to get into the substance of the um, of the event this afternoon, um, and you don't really want to hear me um, droning on telling you about the university and about uh, about about Leicester. Other than to say that we are very sorry that we're not able to welcome you to a residential event, but we do feel that having um, worked our way around and come to terms with the fact that world events took that opportunity away from us and we moved into the virtual world, that we, uh, we feel that there are many opportunities um, in, that, in that setting and using that technology, um, which almost make up for not having a residential event when we could have that face face and informal contact with each other. Um, so I'm Professor Dave Ward. I'm based in the School of Applied Social Sciences at De Montfort University and it's a school which hosts professional degrees for probation officers and police officers among others. So um, we're very, very pleased to be able to host this event um, and to welcome you all to Montfort University virtually. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, I've been asked uh, to facilitate this event. My, my name's John Scott. And uh, the next thing on our agenda is just to check everyone's okay with the format and that um, our listeners also understand what we're attempting to do. Um, we've got four people who are going to do a short introduction to their paper, but the idea is just to point us to uh, maybe a few main points and then to act as a discussion starter. Uh, and that we're hoping that you will want to follow this up and either look on the website or on Twitter to find out more about uh, the network and the sort of ideas that we're wanting to pursue. And if you're interested to find us, uh, the, the, the Twitter address is at INTCJ Network, and the web address is criminaljusticenetwork.net. And this is all very new. Uh, it's really just starting uh, this week. And we'll be pleased to see you and to have you visit and to have your comments. Um, in terms of the format, um, there are about 12 or 13 of us taking part today. Uh, and then as we get used to the format, the hope is that the Zoom will 
enable us to get more comments and more people join us live as the, uh, the seminar grows in scope. Uh, we've got one person who's only able to join us down the line. So uh, that, that's Sonia Flynn from uh, the National Probation Service. So Sonia, please make sure that uh, uh, you shout up if you've got a comment or a question, we'll be pleased to add you. Um, but that uh, in, in a discussion like this, uh, it's important that everybody feels they have a voice and a contribution because we're coming from different perspectives and different standpoints. Uh, and also, I'll try quite often to make sure we do a name check so that people know who it is that's saying things rather than they're just a, a voice or a, uh, from, from, from nowhere. Um, can I just check that everybody's okay with that format and that if we can keep the conversation going, that's great. But if it pauses or that we're, we're, we're running out of steam, well, then that's perhaps a, a reason that we'll then move on and, and take, the next, take the next speaker. Can I just ask for clarification? When Please people do. want to make a, uh, an injection and a point, yeah. how do you choose? Uh, we put our hands up. Okay, that's that, that's 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 good. Mostly, I think because we're only we're, we're less than fifteen people. Uh, Rob's advisors that mostly people can just interject. I think during the the, the introductions that people make hold back while people are doing their introduction piece bill i think but then when the discussion is starting um uh usually it's okay to interject but if you want to make a point and you, you know either your uh the connection isn't very good just if you just raise your hand i'll then pick it up and make sure as a facilitator i'll, I'll get it back to you okay um sometimes uh zoom uh, homes in and puts the yellow square around the person who shouts loudest. <laughs> so it'll be my job, Bill, to make sure that uh, every voice is heard. Um, and uh, when we when we look at how well it's gone, you can give me feedback about whether I gave everybody that voice. So I, what I suggest is that while people are doing their introduction, we're quiet, and then when they open it out, then we have allow a discussion to take place. I think shorter points are better. And as always, the listening is as important as the talking. John, I think, just sorry to interrupt, it's Abdul here. I think also just on the participants, there's a facility if you click the participants to raise your hand, which might, um, if you go sort of into participants and click that button, it shows everybody who's participating. And then at the bottom, it says invite, mute me or raise hand. And there's chat yeah. facility underneath that. So that's another way people can sort of interject if they want to, if they feel they don't want to interrupt because someone's in flow. Yeah. Okay. So people, people seeing that on the bottom of the screen along, along the bottom, if, they, if you move, move your mouse, if you're on a PC. Okay. Any other comments about everyone happy with, okay with the format? Yeah. We're giving it a go. And certainly one of the things we will be doing is asking everyone to give us a bit of feedback so we can be better next time. And, and the learning points will be for everybody. Any other comments? <clears throat> okay. Well, thank, thanks. For, for, we, we've got this far. That's good. Right. So the, the, other, the, the other hint, I think, is that if you mute while somebody's doing a presentation, that also, I think, helps. Um, and then there aren't uh, sounds off, whether it be from my son's dog or uh, from the phone bell ring. So with, let's look at the, uh, back to get back to the agenda, if you would, and let's look at the first discussion starter, which is going to be led by uh, Anna Esquerra Raqueta. Uh, Anna uh, is a lecturer at Barcelona University part-time and has a, a, another job as the policy and liaison officer the Confederation of European Probation. Uh, she also has a two-year-old daughter, so I don't know how she managed during shutdown in Barcelona. And on that note, I'm very pleased to hand, hand over to Anna and to remind her to unmute as she starts. Thank you very much, Anna. Yes. Um, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. 
First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this encounter for giving me the opportunity to take part of these exchanges and network. So thank you very much. I think it's a really interesting proposal. And I'm also glad to see some colleagues and friends of what I call the European Probation and Prison Network. So um, I prepared actually more or less a 10 minutes um, speech or reflection uh, or debriefing about my article. So I hope it's not too much. So let's get started. Um, to think about what the impact of COVID-19 will be is also to think about how the future will be. And while thinking about how to imagine the future, a very well-known saying came into my mind, which says, it's important to know the past in order to understand the present and to imagine the future. From this sentence, I began to structure my reflection in, e in each of the areas in which I'm involved. And the fact I had to reflect on this issue at a global level also let me question ways of doing my own professional praxis. To start, I'd like to ask each of you whether you have had the chance to wonder how the pandemic has affected you both personally and professionally. I'm sure that you have, and I'm also sure that you realize that nothing will be exactly the same. We all have changed in a way somehow. To me, one of the many examples that seems to best illustrate the impact of this corona crisis is the proposal of some journalists to point out that the acronym BC will no longer mean before Christ, but before the coronavirus. How was life before the coronavirus? Will international development work in the criminal justice field be the same? You all have read my article, so based on the idea, ideas developed in it, I would like to share some insights. The ideas I want to share are not about, let's say, immutable postulates and conclusions, but rather about my personal and particular experience as a Catalan woman, a Southern European citizen, and may I say, young, working in the criminal justice field. So I'm going to highlight main ideas and then at the end, ask a few questions, if we have enough time. So at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis was a shock. I remember that on a Thursday, the government announced that the confinement would start. And one day later, on a Friday, we were all working from home, canceling activities, trying to reorganize our office work schedule into a homework office schedule, giving university lectures through online collaborative platforms, and so on. I remember the first days of it living really in uncertainty. We were all very alert on what government would say, and we were actually a bit anxious to know until when the lockdown measures would be implemented. I was especially upset at realizing that I had no control over my working calendar. The work I had prepared with my colleagues over long months was put on hold until further notice. Apart from all this, my family and I as many other thousands and millions of families found ourselves locked down at home, having to take care of our children 24 seven. This of course is not a problem. The problem is having to combine and take care at the same time, having to work from home. Some of you will know what I'm talking about and some others might figure it out. I also had different phone calls with my former colleagues that are probation officers. They also found themselves working from home from one day to another, having to organize what we call the professional setting in the dining room at home, phone calling probation clients with their personal mobile phones, explaining that the offices were closed and that they would do the ordinary and follow-up follow -up interviews by telephone or using other virtual tools. In many other cases, they were reporting that their community measure was suspended until further notice. Different countries around the world were closing their doors all of a sudden, stopping their activities and confining their citizens without knowing all the implications this would have. But what was important during this time? What are the relevant ideas I would like to share as opportunities for international development? First of all, 
the reinvention. The reinvention focusing on more online activities and increasing the visibility of our website has been a key factor. This is something that as an international organization we were already doing, but COVID-19 has only but accelerated. At the beginning of the lockdown and due to travel restrictions, we thought that the interest on international exchanges would decrease at some point. We understood that the different probation systems would be very much focused into solving their own lockdown and into, and into implementing urgent manner, uh, measures and to manage the situation. So therefore, I thought, okay, uh, international exchanges would really have to wait. But the reality showed us that this was not the case. Very positively, the data I shared in the article indicate the contrary. The interest on international exchanges increased from one day to another, as well as attendance to virtual and online activities. This situation shows us that the crisis of COVID-19 has not questioned international relations, but rather the opposite. From my point of view, what has been questioned is the method, the way to make and to organize these encounters. Although online meetings will never be able to replace face-to-face -face meetings, why don't we rethink the organization's internal travel policies by keeping face-to-face -face meetings for very specific issues and give more weight to virtual exchanges? Virtual exchanges save money and time, they are more effective and sustainable, and we can reach a wider audience. Also, during pandemic times or afterwards, it is much more important and relevant to share knowledge among different countries and to build a solid network of international partners in order to share programs and solutions, as Vivian Gerian, John Scott, Joan Burnesco, and Sonia Flynn, and perhaps uh, Kirsten might know, the Confederation of European Probation was founded in 1981 by 10 different European countries, which faced a problem. They faced the same problem and wanted to exchange information on that problem. That problem at that time was on foreign nationals in prison and probation. So perhaps this could be understood as a, an opportunity to bring people together to discuss and share knowledge and good practices. Also beyond international relations, it's important to emphasize that the pandemic will have a direct impact on the vulnerable groups the probation and prison systems work with. According to data recently released by the Spanish Ministry of Home Affairs, Crime has decreased uh, in Spain during the lockdown by 73.8%. Having said that, we know that other types of crimes have increased, such as domestic violence, child abuse, cybercrime. I do think that juveniles and young adult offenders also need a special interest. At the beginning of the speech, I mentioned the importance to understand the past to imagine the future. So what we learned from the 2008 crisis is that the worst hit, hit population segment were juveniles. In, Sp in Spain, in 2012, um, there was a really, really, really high rate of, un of unemployment. In some regions, it went over 60%. In a crisis context, already a juvenile not involved in a criminal justice system sees this, their opportunities reduced. This fact becomes more relevant among juveniles or young adults who have committed an offense or a crime. If jobs are being destroyed, what kind of resource opportunity are we going to offer to these youngsters? How they will be able to step out of crime? Actually, on Monday, I was reading an article in which indicated that with the start of the deconfinement measures, the street delinquency has started to increase very fast, especially muggings committed by youngsters. And of course, all this has interesting implications for probation, with raises in cases of domestic abuse, child sexual abuse, cybercrime, and young people with really reduced job opportunities. It is very important to reflect on the type of offenders that probation services may have in the coming months and years. During the lockdown, affecting different justice systems, 
urgent measures have also been implemented to face the COVID-19 pandemic. These measures were aimed to decrease prison population, so to avoid the spread of the disease. One example of these measures is releasing certain categories of prisoners by putting them under probation. We all know that to reduce crime, it becomes really important to use community sanctions and measures which do not break social ties of offenders. But it is much more important to bear in mind that to put more people under probation must never lead to probation overcrowding, nor to irresponsible pressure on the probation officer's caseload. Alternative sanctions must be meaningful and used properly in order to avoid mass supervision. Mm. Well, um, yes, if I have time, I also would like to say or to share with you that several thinkers such as Stephen Walt or Yuval Noel Harari have already reflected on the fact that this context of uncertainty caused by the coronavirus places at a turning point where I actually see two possible outcomes happening. On the one hand, this could be an opportunity to give our society a, st a stronger sense of community and to work toward greater solidarity and so improve international exchanges. But on the other hand, it could also open the door toward an even more individualistic and secular society, which would have a huge impact on, on the level of crime, local and transnational. It will therefore depend on local and transnational actions to create a feeling of community and belonging to this community to reduce uh, crime rates. So, after all this, and to close my contribution, I have to be honest and I have to tell you that I have more questions than answers. I have prepared four general round of questions which I would like to ask the group. I think it will be interesting to share ideas, but first I'd like to ask the moderator what is best to do. If I should ask the four round of questions, one after the other, or I should wait, or John, please. Okay. What did you... Well, first of all, th thanks for sticking to the time. That's great. Um, so, um, if you'd like to uh, unmute everybody and be, be be ready to join in in in, in the discussion, um, uh, Anna, uh, let's s you ask your first question, and let's see if that starts things going. And let's see how the conversation goes and hold back your other questions to see if things slow, go slowly. My suspicion is that with this group, there'll be no shortage of people wanting to say things. So, <laughs> Rob, if we um, let everybody un unmute now. Um, so what's your first question, Anna? Yes. Well, the first round of questions is related to the increased interest in international exchanges. During my speech, and in the article, I mentioned and showed some data which indicates that there has been an increased interest in international exchanges through online virtual tool tools. My questions to reflect are, will this increased interest in international exchanges and in knowing what other probation systems are doing regarding COVID-19 continue after the lockdown? Or is it just a short-term interest? Will this increased international interest be also extended to what we call other classic issues in the field of the criminal justice field, such as mental health, juveniles, young adult offenders, drug consumption, drug use, and so on? Or will this interest only be on how the different criminal justice systems manage the COVID-19 pandemic? How we will be able or how will we have to organize future international activities okay thank you okay right over to the group then there's there's anna's question uh, what's been your experience of international exchange okay Hi. kirsten maybe uh, i can uh, start uh, responding as our organization that I'm representing Europe is uh, can be compared to what Anna is representing CEP. Um, the, we, of course, we have seen uh, a similar um, urge for uh, exchanging what is happening in different countries. And I think that's 
in a way, it's also normal if you respond to a crisis situation where you need uh, urgently answers on uh, specific um, questions that came up because it was new for everyone in a way, how to deal with it and how to address all the challenges. So uh, that there was a um, sudden increase in exchange and also, let's say, in a, in a daily exchange, that was kind of new. Uh, and I think, um, I'm not sure if it will continue on the same level when the crisis is going down. But what I actually hope is that maybe for some uh, players in the international field, or more maybe on the national field, that have sometimes a bit doubts about the value of uh, international meetings and relations, that it became a bit more clear for them that there is a real value in that to hear about how other countries are dealing with certain. So I, I hope that this, um, well, uh, kind of, uh, how to say, um, strengthens the work that we do, that we are trying to do as international network organizations. and. Uh, uh, increases the value of it and for future international activities just very short uh, of course it has been um, all the face-to-face uh, -face meetings like this one have been replaced by online meetings and uh, that will probably continue I don't see it as much as a replacement of the face-to-face -face meeting as more as an addition to what we did face-to-face -face, because there is a value in face-to-face -face meetings that cannot be uh, uh, replaced by, by online uh, sessions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Johan from uh, Romania. Yes, uh, very good question, uh, Anna, and uh, hi, good to see you again. Um, my, my opinion is that the, the interest in the, in the COVID uh, crisis would stay for a while. I can see already quite an inflation of, uh, of interest in this respect. I can see a lot of uh, books coming out, special issues of journals, uh, different webinars and so on, all about what, what is going on, what happened during the crisis and how, how the, the correctional organizations managed to, to adapt to this, uh, to this crisis. So I think the interest will stay for a while uh, at least for one or two years, but of course, depending on uh, how long the crisis will last, uh, one way or another. Um, but what I think it's really it's really important at this point is to reflect on what we can learn from this uh, experience. Uh, I, I'm afraid that we will go back to the business as usual without take, taking the learning out of this uh, experience. I think we we managed to to innovate in some areas that used to be quite conservative. And uh, I'm, the first example that comes to my mind is uh, the, uh, the development of uh, video uh, online uh, visits uh, in, in the prisons or, you know, these kind of things. They were, they were not very popular in, in the prison uh, systems, especially in the Eastern Europe. But now they, are, they became the new normal. Uh, and I think they are very useful. They should not replace the normal, the face-to-face -face visits, of course, but they should become part of the normal routine. They should complement the normal, the face-to-face -face visits. And I'm afraid that they will be gone after the crisis is, is over. So I think the, the main challenge for us is to, how are we gonna manage to preserve the learning from this crisis and use, continue to use the, uh, the good uh, innovation uh, elements uh, in the future. Um, so that's, that's my view. Thank mm -hmm. you. Abdul wanted to come in. Abdul, as a police perspective. Yeah, yeah I, um, I think uh, Juan sort of um, captured most of what I was going to say, which is around mm -hmm. how do we capture this learning. It seems to me that as ever, practitioners and people in the field uh, cooperate regardless we i think we have a really good record of cooperating and, and so on in, in all sorts of very difficult circumstances but what i'm sort of disappointed about is sort of what appears to be a lack of international cooperation by inter governments and, and, and so on um, on the one hand they, they are sort of cooperating in terms of trying to share data around coronavirus but there's a big element where 
you know, there's a lot of blame gaming going on. The, the politics isn't exactly one of leadership to my mind. It's, it's quite polemic, even in a crisis like this. And um, I think how, how do practitioners and people in the field kind of carry on being able to cooperate, carry on capturing the, the lessons? In, in a sort of era, I think, where political leadership uh, and governmental leadership is lacking somewhat, and that's a huge challenge for us as practitioners. Mm. Vivian, I wondered whether there was a, a Council of Europe perspective on capturing the learning. Yeah, I would, I would agree with what has been said already, and I think there will be some rebalancing in, in a general sense after the, hopefully after the crisis uh, passes. Um, I don't think we will ever be, as Anna said, quite the same again. So I think we will return to some of the face-to-face -face stuff, but I think we will uh, also use hopefully some of the learning that we've got through the <coughs> online uh, activities that, that we've engaged in, like, like this one. But I think both will, you know, the face-to-face -face will come back up to what level I don't know, and the online bit will go back down a little bit, but neither will go back to fully where where they were before. I I do think that there are you know that there are a lot of things that can be done as we are doing now online, but I do think whether it's the one to one contact of a probation officer with their client, uh, or to answer your question about the Council of Europe uh, activity. Uh, you, you know, equally there, there's a certain amount you can do online, but there's a lot goes on in those activities that you can't do online. And just to get, if I can be so bold as to give another example, I can't imagine how uh, the current negotiations over Brexit can happen online. I would think some of them can happen. Uh, some of the some of the strands of that can probably happen online, and I'd have to say I've, I've no direct experience of this, obviously, but I can't imagine how you could conduct uh, that level and that intensity of discussion and negotiation on something so critical totally online. So uh, I do think that there will be a return to a lot of the face-to-face -face activities, but hopefully it will lead us to question the you know those areas and see what what we can do more of online. And just to go back to something I think Johan and uh, Kirsten touched on, I think a lot of what we're doing now, obviously, is caused directly by the COVID-19 crisis. But I do think that, uh, as well as that, uh, the fact that we've had to do things in a different way because of COVID has opened up a whole new lot of possibilities uh, that should still remain afterwards. And just to give an example of that, I got an email this week from the European uh, Criminological Society about the, the online conference that will take place in September. Now, I, I feel I would definitely take part in that. Uh, whether I would physically have gone to the one, I think it was to be in Bucharest, uh, I may or, or I may not. So I, I think having something like that uh, online is, is very doable. Uh, and maybe having some combination of activities afterwards will uh, help to develop things on both fronts. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious, Sonia, um, it might be harder for you to uh, get a word in. Is there something you'd like to contribute at the moment? Um, I mean, yes. I, I mean, I recognise what Anna was saying about that kind of hiatus of interest in what each of us were doing as we responded to this international crisis and I agree with some of the other speakers that I think the process of recovery is going to be a lot it's going to go on for, for months years um, it was interesting in a recent um, meeting I had with the heads of probation um, from Scotland Northern Ireland Wales and what um, and well um, that we're all um, having to confront the same common issues in terms of the impact of prosecution and courts having slowed down and the backlog that's creating in the system at the same time that um, all of our prisons now have um, significantly lower populations again as a consequence of the prison the courts having shut down for an extended period and what impact that will have on their population when the courts stand up again um, mm. which then leads to an interesting debate is this a, is this a point for um, us to reevaluate the purpose of prison 
Am I being too optimistic to think that actually what this um, virus has shown us is that our inflated prison populations to little um, can't be afforded for the future, both in terms of health, from a health aspect, um, but also from a kind of, uh, yeah, from a public health aspect, um, if they fill up to the extent they were before, and with the general turnover and footfall of short-term prisoners. Mm. So for me, COVID presents many opportunities alongside all of the others that have been presented in terms of some of the things we've learned about um, more flexible ways of working, uh, using how we use digital um, and technology to um, support the supervisory relationship. I think what's interesting in all of this is um, I think some of why we will be able to maintain contact with our service users, with the offenders, is that they, like the rest of the population, were suffering from anxiety and concern. And actually, the call from the probation officer was often, for many of them, the only human contact they had over many weeks. It'll be interesting to see as we go into easing measures, whether that form of distant supervision stands up when people have got other other distractions and they're now allowed to walk around and meet other people. Mm. So those are my observations. Hey, thanks very much, Sonia, it's good. Uh, uh, Nick, um, I wondered if you were about to say something then and didn't get the chance. Yeah. No, I, I did, I tried to raise your hand um, button, but I don't know if it worked. But anyway, <laughs> I was raising my hand, yeah. Yeah, um, good. Yeah. Uh, uh, a few points. Um, I think I think one of the things that COVID has shown us is things we thought were absolutely not possible, all of a sudden are possible. For instance, pregnant women being released from prison um, is just a, a simple but really significant example. Um, I think what it's also done in terms of collaboration is removed some of the barriers that people who are less resourced, if I can use that term, to take part in international collaboration. Um, that some of those barriers have been removed. Uh, I work for an international organisation, we travel a hell of a lot and all of a sudden that has stopped. Um, and we enjoy that travel a lot of the time, um, but we enjoy it at a cost. And we've seen environmentally what that cost maybe is. And now with those um, barriers removed for a period of time. I think it has opened up the avenues for a much greater um, swathe of the population to have access to international collaboration. So maybe, uh, especially around these issues around around the justice system as a whole, people who are affected by it, who are stuck in the middle of it who would find it difficult to access these kind of events all of a sudden can do so because all they need is an internet connection and although even for some that can be difficult um but i think that that's a, that's a real uh, that's something that we should very much take away from this carry from this and not and not revert back to the usual suspects taking part in this kind of collaboration uh, i think the other thing it's shown us because people have been stuck with their phones or their or their laptop um, and nothing else, is the and we knew social media was powerful before, but I think it's amplified the power of social media. And I think what's happened with the death of George Floyd and everything that's followed has amplified because of the COVID crisis and the fact that people are watching more, partly because they have haven't got other things that they can do that they normally would have been doing. So I think that's a, that's a confirmation of the importance of that. And, uh, and I think something we should think about in terms of lesson, lessons learned as to how we take that forward. And the final little point I'll, I'll make is my sort of specific interest, of course, is around policing, is um, when Anna mentioned that crime has gone down by 73.8%. It makes you wonder what the police have been doing if the crime has reduced so much, and this is true in the UK as well, crime has gone down significantly. I know from talking to police people um, who've been working dur during this time, they've been bored. They haven't had anything to do. Well, I thought they'd be really busy and they haven't been. Um, and that brings into question all sorts of things, not only their involvement and implementation of 
the COVID rules, restrictions, confinement restrictions, etc. Um, but also, do we need as much and as many police as we have now? And I think that's an interesting thing to take forward from this as well. Mm. Okay, um, uh, Nikki Woods, um, you work uh, in, a, in a sector which uh, involves women's issues. Um, uh, is, is a women's perspective in the impact of COVID? Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. So I, I work in um, the Earlswood Detention Centre. I work for a charity that works there, which of course is the only women's detention centre in, in Britain. Um, and there has been a significant release of people, perhaps you all know how much of a release of people there's been from the detention centres. Um, and I think that's quite interesting, they're released into the community, but there's no continuity um, for them with respect to how they are um, supported in the community. Um, and also very much also if they're deported, it's the same thing, there's no continuity between. So women are released and they have no support from family or friends and therefore this the level of isolation has been much more acute. When we talk about the access to communication, I would just say that it depends very much if you have the tools and if you haven't got the tools, your isolation is even more acute. Um, so I perhaps would mention some element of that to be considered to throw a little bit of a, um, a different perspective on it. It's, it is very much about, about access and ownership. And if you have, if you have neither, then, um, then some of what we're saying, it's, it's sort of taking a look at the more marginalized and the people who have the least have even less in the, in the crisis that we are seeing. Yeah. So I might raise something about that, John. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm conscious that um, we we could spend the whole time uh, exploring this. Um, some really great points come out. Uh, Anna, um, you, you've sparked off loads of discussion. You said you had three more questions. Yes. Do you see the point I'm getting at? So what I'm going to do is ask you just to see if you've got a, a last point you'd like to make, because we're going to move, we're going to need uh, to move on to to Vivian in a moment or two. Have you got a last point you'd like to make before we move on? Uh, when you say point, you mean if you like, if I like to ask another question? No, no, no. If you ask another question, <laughs> we would spend all afternoon. On it. Uh, okay. Is there anything else you'd just like no. to, to say? Okay. No, that's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your paper, which um, you know, I, I was, went down really well with me, if not with anybody else. So thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh, I'm sure this will start up a whole flurry of, uh, of connectivity. So thanks very much, Anna. Um, we're going to change direction uh, and certainly uh, voice. Uh, and I'd like you, if you would look down to your next discussion starter, we're going to now move on to Vivian Guerin. Um, Vivian uh, has a background. He's a, a, a qualified social worker and he's had a, a leading role across Europe, um, particularly in the Council of Europe, where he's taken uh, a key role on several committees relating to policy and strategy on uh, criminal justice. And his, uh, he recently retired as the director of the Irish Probation Service. And um, from that perspective, I'm sure he's got plenty that he can offer us. And I'd like to hand the uh, the floor, if you can have a virtual floor, uh, to Vivian for the seminar. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, John. Um, and I don't propose to go through my paper, which I circulated. Um, in it, though, I, I was keen to point out that I believe fundamentally that we all individually and as nations or jurisdictions or whatever, we all live in each other's shadows. Uh, and that implies that we can learn from each other, whatever our history or whatever our current circumstances. Um, using the background of my own experience in Ireland and internationally, then I listed seven different ways in which I believe or I've seen that international cooperation takes place already. And I also gave eight practical examples of international criminal justice cooperation from my own direct experience of it and in it. 
And I went on then to describe the work of the Council for Penological Cooperation, uh, which is part of the Council of Europe, uh, as well as pointing out why I believe it is important and why it's reasonably effective, despite whatever criticisms we make in what it does. And some of the reasons, as I reflect on and see them, for why I believe the Council for Penological Cooperation's work process works quite well. Uh, and because, you know, the, the, the working group uh, and the process that surrounds it does produce uh, some good work on an ongoing basis. And I believe that there is potentially valuable learning for other types of international cooperation there. Having said that, I do believe that while structures and processes are important in everything uh, and uh, that they help the success of uh, what can happen what can happen and does happen, I also believe that uh, what will be possible in the future as well as what currently happens does depend and will depend on the commitment of individuals individually and collectively and the quality and the extent of the relationships that they, we, build with others. My overarching point, uh, or a couple of points, are, first of all, that there is already quite a lot of international cooperation in criminal justice already happening. Uh, some of that is, is very structured and organized. Some of it works well. Some of it may be less well. Uh, and a lot of it takes place on an ad hoc type basis. The other side of that coin is that at the same time, I believe there are many gaps uh, and there are therefore potentially limitless opportunities to develop that cooperation further in new ways, as well as in building on what is already there. And in terms of why people come together, and this is reflecting on what does happen and, and doesn't happen already, uh, I believe that people and bodies like organizations collaborate for a number of reasons. And to some extent, in my experience, they break down into, they collaborate because they have to, or because they want to. And either way, they have to be at least aware of the possibilities and be willing or helped to overcome any obstacles. And again, we've seen some examples of what have brought people to the table in the recent uh, pandemic crisis and the, the issues that that gave, they, uh, gave rise to. I also believe, and this is a very simple point, uh, but I think it's a hugely important one. Uh, one of the really strong elements of value for this particular new international development network initiative uh, coming out of De Montfort is that English is the de facto language of international cooperation. I've often commented to people from the beginning of my involvement in the Council of Europe, I feel continually spoiled by the fact that uh, various uh, forums that I attend or meetings uh, you know, people uh, conduct the business generally uh, through English, and I think that's that's a hugely uh, advantageous position. And I think it's to a large extent. I'm I'm oversimplifying, but I think it's largely largely accepted uh, to some extent that English is is that language of cooperation internationally. I do believe that there are two potential areas for uh, for development, um, broadly speaking. One is to build on. Uh, and plug into the existing channels and structures of international cooperation in criminal justice. And another critical area that I think is open for development is to connect the connections. So I think a lot of international cooperation happens in a bilateral way uh, between small groups. Uh, and sometimes outside of those arrangements or those groups, uh, there may be relatively little sharing with other ind other individual bodies or networks or groups. And I think that's a huge uh, area of possibility for international cooperation. Also, I think we can build, and this was the uh, subject of a lot of discussion and the, the questions posed by Anna. I think that we can build on uh, the possibilities that are offered by ICT, uh, which in itself have recently been given uh, greater or stronger wings by the restrictions brought about by the COVID pandemic. And just to finish off then, uh, I'm in the middle of reading a book right now. Uh, I didn't include this in, in my paper, uh, but I think it's quite relevant to what we are talking about today. Some of you may have come across it before. I hadn't until recently. 
And the book is called Dialogue and the Art of Thinking Together. Uh, and it was written by a, go a guy by the name of Bill Isaacs over 20 years ago. And I just want to share with you what the author describes as the book's, quote, sim simple premise. And that is that neither the enormous challenges human beings face today, nor the wonderful promise of the future on whose threshold we seem to be poised, can be reached unless human beings learn to think together in a very new way. That's the end of the, the quote. And so just to finish, one of my hopes for this network is that it may be, uh, or it may become, just such a new way of thinking together in criminal justice. Thank you for your attention. Th thank you, Vivian. That's, that, that, that's great. Um, what would be good would be for uh, people to pick up any points that they would like to from, from what you've said. Um, your um, article was reflective on structures, how structures and process and people interact. And here we are, very different experiences, and in a way the internet provides a different process, doesn't it? And we're right at the beginning of seeing whether social media can allow um, us to react and make connections in new ways that are a bit uncomfortable maybe for us. And um, I would like people to reflect on whether seminars like this will make connections for ideas that can feed into policy uh, ideas and structures. So using Vivian's paper and his discussion starter now, who would like to pick up and run with that idea? Thank a hand up from Rob Canton. So unmute Bob, Rob and go for it. Thank you. I haven't been clever enough to work out how to put up my electronic hand, but that's unimportant. I just wanted to pick up something that Vivian said about the quality of relationships. Relationships can take place online and we are relating to one another now. And I'm trying to understand, I imagine a number of us are trying to understand what changes about the quality of those relationships? I don't know if any of you or many of you have seen a blog that was done by our friend Fergus McNeil, um, reflecting upon the experience of criminal justice social workers in Scotland and the difference it's made um, to their working experience. And he talks about the need for developing different talents, different skills, different ways of what he refers to and others refer to as emotional labor. And one, I think, fairly obvious point is that if you had a good relationship before, when you all met face to face, it's much easier to sustain and develop that subsequently when you come to meet together online. But if you haven't met somebody before, and if you don't meet them in a forum where there is that kind of support, it's that much harder to establish those things. But trying to, to unpack for myself, because I'm not at all clear about this, what makes the difference and what can and can't be done online. So Vivian, having agreed with you about the importance of the quality of relationships, I want to also ask you about, you said that you couldn't possibly do the Brexit negotiations online. Well, they've been doing them for a long time face to face and got absolutely nowhere. So is this just a matter of complexity? Is, 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 is it because it's hard or is it because when people meet together in a room, there are other kinds of things that are happening off stage. So if we were now meeting in Leicester, as soon as we'd finished, we'd go off together, we'd have a cup of tea, we'd enjoy each other's company, we'd exchange news about our families and all of these things that I think are softer ways of essential lubricants, not only to a, the quality of a relationship, but actually to the efficiency of the business. And how much of that is lost and how much of that is changed and how much is sustainable, those are things that are exercising me at the moment, but like mm. Anna, I have more questions than answers. Mm. Do you want to comment on that, Vivian? Yeah, um, I, I absolutely agree with the point I think uh, Rob is making. And if I can bring it back to the, 
one of the aspects of the Brexit negotiations. I remember, I can't, or I can't recall how long ago, it's, it's certainly a year or so ago, when there was a, a sticking point over uh, an element of, quote unquote, the Irish question in, in the Brexit negotiations and where our Prime Minister met the British Prime Minister and went for a walk in a park somewhere near Liverpool. And all of a sudden, uh, reports in the media were that whatever the, the sticking point was, had been overcome or, or largely overcome. I don't think that would have happened uh, if they had a Zoom call together. And I do think that there are certain things that happen uh, in meetings on the side, uh, you know, the, the point of beer rob down near the cathedral in Strasbourg or whatever it is, um, which I believe some people have had from time to time. You know, there, there are elements like that that you can't, you just can't reproduce them uh, online. So I think on, on, online is a fantastic facility. Uh, I just do think that there are certain things, you know, the, the, the catching up on the, on, the, on the personal stuff with uh, somebody else or whatever it is. Um, and I think part of the point that I, I read Fergus's blog, I think what he said is absolutely right. But being human beings, we always try or generally try to make the best of the, of the situation. So if we have to do something in a more restricted way, we'll generally try to do what we have to do to make that work, but it may or may not be ideal. Other people like to come in? Uh, Anna, I think, has indicated yes. yes. Yes, I actually find very interesting what you are discussing and about what kind of activities uh, can be done online and what other cannot be done online. Um, I would like to talk to talk about virtual activities and home working that as I say, have a double side. On the one hand, when it comes to certain jobs or activities, we save time and money and we are more efficient. Um, during three months, we showed that it has been possible to work, give university lectures, socialize, and leave avoiding travels and people's movements. We have organized different international and virtual activities with great interest and having lots of participation. And uh, that showed actually that virtual collaborative tools give the opportunity to open up international relations to a, a, wider, a wider audience of prof professionals without the economic cost of travel, which is very positive and might be implemented in different international organizations in the coming years. But as you, as Rob and Vivian uh, already mentioned, there is another side Thinking, for example, about provision clients, my question would be, does remote working improve prevention, treatment, management and reintegration, or does it make it worse? In what ways is this happening? How does remote working impact relationship with clients? How does it impact resilience and confidence? And of course, this, this has much to do with uh, the digital divide amongst provision clients. Indeed, not all provision clients, for example, have access to internet and uh, other related digital tools to effectively communicate with provision officers. Perhaps this would be also an interesting topic to discuss mm. at an international seminar. Sure, okay. Um, Bill would, has indicated he would like to come in. Thank you, Bill. Unmute. Um, you need to unmute, Bill, please. Thank you. For me, the clear um, issue is about trust. If you've met people face to face for some time and you're not asking people to take uh, risks, then you actually don't need much trust. You're quite confident about what you're being asked to get into and with who. Uh, trust is built um, through a, a process of, a uh, very important process of uh, deep relationship exposure. Um, and so in your point about what can be done and not done between probation officers and their clients, you can't have trust unless there's been some really good sharing. Um, that's both ways. Can't trust the probation officer. Probation officer can't trust the, the client. So, what these forums are, are good at is exchanging information, not building new relationships. Um, 
trust requires, I mean, trust is about taking risk and being prepared to take that risk, which is why Vivian's point about Brexit, I think, is entirely correct. Mm. Um, it's all about risk, and there's a very, very little trust um, between the parties. Um, but they can hammer out things better um, in a, a more flexible um, manner. In this environment, you don't really need to trust each other. We're not taking any risks. Um, and we are basically um, confident people who are sharing ideas and information. So it works extremely well. In other environments, and I'll be mentioning mine, which is the last paper, um, you really can't operate without building uh, mutual trust, and that has to be earned. You can't expect it. Mm. And, and in a way, what we're all saying is that uh, perhaps you have to have face-to-face -face and uh, electronic or virtual contacts and choose which is the best method for the type of encounter that you want. You, know, you can't do everything online. Um, is, is perhaps something that's emerging from this. I'm conscious that uh, time is going on. Would anybody else like to pick up this thread of discussion before we move on to the next topic? Is there a hand going up? I don't, I don't see one. So Vivian, thank you again for your paper, which is gonna be on the website. Um, I found particularly interesting the, the range of image that you used, which is always stretching and um and was was really helpful and uh, for anyone who reads the paper uh, it's, it's really good to th to think that uh you've had a lot of leadership responsibilities and the sensitivity with which you think about both process and structure and people was was illuminating so thanks very much for pro producing that piece of work um uh, on the agenda, everybody, I suggested we, we should um, take a couple of minutes break. Um, the, it's quite hard to concentrate s s uh, staring at a screen. So I'm going to hold to that so that we can take our headphones off and um, jump up and down. And if you need to do a, um, a, a three minute dash anywhere, um, let's do that now. Um, but we're going to return uh, to uh, have an input from Abdul. Uh, and uh, he's coming uh, to issues from a police perspective, and you're gonna need to hear this. So I'm gonna hold you to a really tight couple of minutes, two minutes, two and a half minutes break, and then we'll get cracking. So let's just uh, leave the screen stretch. I'm quite keen to take my earphones off. <laughs> so if people would like to do that, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. <laughs> 